Welcome to the Spare Time Physicist. Today, we're going to talk about a length contraction paradox in Einstein's theory of relativity. This paradox is known by many names, either the bar and slit paradox, the rod and slot paradox, or the bar and ring paradox. Here, I will refer to it as the bar and slit paradox. It comes in different versions, but here I'm going to talk about the simplest one, where no acceleration is present and the objects move along with constant velocity. I want to talk about this paradox for a few reasons. First of all, it is a bit overseen, and I could not find any YouTube videos about it. But more importantly, the solutions that has been published so far are missing a very important aspect in their conclusions. Mathematically, the solutions are correct. But as we shall see, the illustrations that are used are, if not faulty, then at least misleading. Over the years, thousands of physics students and professors have analyzed this problem. So you might ask how an error could possibly have survived. Indeed a good question. The answer is simple. Too few physicists have a thorough understanding of the Wigner rotation. What rotation did you say? Exactly. The Wigner rotation is the most overseen effect in special relativity. In fact, most textbooks does not even include it. And yet I will argue that the set of relativistic transformations is incomplete without it. Okay, we better get into it and let's start by introducing the paradox. The bar and slit paradox was suggested by R. Shore in 1962 and the solution I will use as a reference here was published by E. Marx in 1967. In the paradox we have a green bar and a slit in a thin brown plate. As you see here, the bar will not be able to pass through the slit as long as the two are parallel. But if we accelerate the green bar to a relativistic velocity along the horizontal axis, it will become length contracted. If the plate is then accelerated upwards with just the right timing and the length contraction is sufficient to make the bar shorter than the slit, well, then it will pass through even though the two are parallel. Here you have to remember that the length contraction of an object happens along the axis of motion. This means that the bar moving horizontally will become shorter and the plate moving upward will become thinner. Note that in my animations the velocities of the bar and the slit will have the same magnitude of 86.6% of the speed of light. This equates to a gamma factor, or Lorentz factor if you will, of 2. As you see in the animation, this means that the bar will have half of its original length, while the plate will have half of its original thickness. Let's run the animation and see what happens. Clearly the bar went through the slit with no collision, as we expected. If we now shift to the perspective of the slit, we will see that the slit is at rest and that the bar is now moving diagonally toward the slit. I will denote this reference frame SS as it is the rest frame of the slit. As we see in this next animation, the bar is still length contracted and will easily pass through the slit. So far, so good. The paradox arises when we want to see things from the perspective of the bar. In the rest frame of the bar, denoted SB, it will no longer be length contracted. So how will it pass through the slit? Einstein's theory of relativity does not allow for multiple realities. This means that if the bar passes in one frame, well, then it will have to do so in all possible frames. Of course, this is not a real paradox. The solution is simply to use the relativistic transformations, do the math and find the coordinates of the plate with the slit in. It turns out that the plate becomes angled with respect to the bar and therefore it is able to pass without hitting it. Problem solved. This was not really a paradox. Marx then goes on to analyze a slightly different experiment. He turns the whole setup 45 degrees and then accelerates the bar towards the slit. Again, the bar and the slit starts out as parallel, but as the bar is accelerated towards the slit, 
it changes its angle due to length contraction. Since the bar is only length contracted in the direction of motion, the trajectories of its edges will remain unchanged. Surprisingly, the bar does not pass through the slit in this second experiment. Further, the bar and the slit now have a different angle with respect to each other than we saw in the first experiment. Marx then simply concludes that the concept of parallelism between bodies in relative motion is a relative one. If we look at the illustrations in the original paper, we will see that all trajectories have an angle of 45 degrees with respect to the object at rest in that frame. In both experiments, the bar and the slit started out as parallel. So, in what way could the two situations be different? It seems an awful lot like the same event, with the coordinate system rotated 45 degree. Further, if we look at the first experiment, there is a lack of symmetry between the frames. In the rest frame of the slit, SS, the bar and the slit were parallel, while in the rest frame of the bar, SB, they had an angle with respect to each other. In the second experiment, on the other hand, the respective angles have the same magnitude in both frames. So, what exactly is going on here? Let's sort this out. As I said in the beginning, the illustrations in Mark's paper are flawed. Nothing is allowed to travel faster than the speed of light, and this means that you can't simply add velocities together as you jump from one frame to the other. If you paid attention to my animations in the beginning, you will have seen that the velocity of the bar in the SS frame and the velocity of the slit in the SB frame were not anti-parallel. And this is the correct solution. In Mark's paper, this is reflected in the calculations. But as we saw, not in the illustrations, where the objects had anti-parallel motion. In the current version of the Wikipedia page on the topic, we see exactly the same problem. The illustrations are drawn with anti-parallel motion. Consequently, the illustrations does not show the same case, but two different cases, and are therefore misleading the reader. Now, you might think that this does not make much sense. If the velocities are not parallel, how could you possibly travel between the rest frame of the slit and the bar? I mean, you would not end up in the same frame because you're accelerating in a different direction, aren't you? This is a very relevant question, which has puzzled many physicists. And we will have to understand the Wigner rotation to answer it. To begin with, we have actually already found the Wigner rotation. If we just measure the angle between the velocity vectors in the SS frame and the SB frame, it pops up right there. But of course, there is also a nice equation which describes it. Note that this equation gives out absolute values and that it does not tell you which direction the rotation is in. Okay, to better understand this effect, let's take a look at the following example. Here we have a simple square. Let's imagine that the square is at rest and that we as the observer travels between different frames of reference. For those of you who are not too familiar with relativity, traveling between reference frames simply means that the observer changes his velocity. Since this is just a thought experiment, let's imagine that we are able to jump between velocities and have time stand still. This means that we don't have to deal with the square moving around and it is allowed mathematically. Let's first jump to a frame that moves at 45 degree to the axis and with a velocity of 86.6% of the speed of light. As before, this will give us a gamma factor of 2. We will denote this frame as prime. As we see here, the square will be length contracted along the axis of the acceleration. Now, let's make a little experiment and choose a different route of acceleration to the S prime system. First, let's perform an acceleration upward along the Y axis and then add an acceleration along the X axis to end up at the 45 degree motion. Luckily, we are smarter than before. 
We now know that we have to use the velocity transformations to figure this out. Remember that you can't just add velocities together, so we have to calculate them first. Computing this, we end up with the following parameters. Okay, so let's first jump to the upward moving frame. We will denote this S double prime. Here we will see that the square gets contracted along the y-axis. When we perform the horizontal acceleration, the square is already at motion and this is what happens. The top and bottom gets angled, while the vertical sides stay parallel to the y-axis. We are now moving at a 45 degree angle with a velocity of 86.6% of the speed of light. So this must be the S prime frame we were aiming for. But wait, the square now looks different than when we accelerate it directly to the S prime frame. Confused? To figure out what has happened here, let's perform the direct transformation back to the rest frame of the square. As we now see, the square is back to its original shape, but it is rotated. This rotation happened as we accelerated horizontally from the S double prime frame. And it means that we actually never reached the S prime frame. It was a different and rotated system and the velocity vector appeared to be 45 degrees only because it had been rotated with the system. The insight we gained here is that the act of accelerating in some cases give rise to a rotation. And this is exactly what we saw in the bar and slit paradox. But be aware, this is not an ordinary rotation. Only objects with non-collinear motion with respect to the direction of the acceleration will be rotated. As this animation shows, objects with different velocities will be rotated with different angles. Here I represent this as small coordinate systems that rotate with the objects. This effect is very different from a classical rotation, where all objects would have to be rotated with the same angle. And this really happens. The effect has been proven experimentally. I plan to talk more about this in my next video and even add a nice little extra proof to the list. So stay tuned for that. So now that we have established a loose understanding of the Wigner rotation, let's get back to the paradox. We have just learned the following. When performing a Lorentz transformation from one frame to another, objects with non-collinear motion will be Wigner rotated, while objects with parallel motion or objects at rest will not. Keep this in mind. In the first version of the paradox, we started out with the bar moving horizontally and the slit moving vertically. When performing the transformation back to the respective rest frames of the bar and the slit, we exactly had a case with objects in non-collinear motion. And therefore it resulted in a Wigner rotation. In the second experiment, the bar started out at rest and was then accelerated directly toward the slit. Since the bar was initially at rest, no Wigner rotation occurred. But wait, if you look at the animation, the bar is still rotated. So how can that be? That is correct. But here the rotation only happened because of the good old length contraction. When the bar is angled with respect to the direction of the contraction, it will be rotated. So there are actually two ways a rotation can occur. In the first case, what we saw was a combined effect. The rotation was both due to length contraction and the Wigner rotation. This is why the respective angles differ in the two rest frames. A direct transformation from the rest frame of the bar SB to the rest frame of the slit SS makes this evident. The transformation is performed along the axis of motion and as we know by now, this will not change the Wigner rotation angle of the two systems. The change we see in angle in this animation only occurs due to length contraction. We then end up in a rotated version of the SS frame. By rotating the slit back to its original horizontal orientation, we see that this is true. 
This example also answers the question we asked earlier about the non-parallel velocity vectors of the bar and the slit. We were simply comparing coordinate systems that had been Wigner rotated with respect to each other. By rotating one of the systems with the Wigner rotation angle, the velocity vectors becomes parallel. The big takeaway from this paradox is that the path of transformation or acceleration, if you will, matters at relativistic velocities. Two subsequent accelerations with non-collinear velocity induces a rotation. And this is not just a mathematical property, it is a real physical rotation. This is why the bar is able to pass through the slit in the first experiment and not the second. If you doubt this, watch the proof in my next video. And if you want to learn more about the Wigner rotation, there's an excellent Wikipedia article on the topic. Link in the description together with all my other references. This concludes the video. I hope it made you wiser or at least confused on a more sophisticated level. If it was useful to you, please like and subscribe to the channel to help me get off the ground. And add a comment if you have questions or corrections. Thank you for watching.